The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled A New View of the Spectrum of HER2 Expression and Significance of HER2 Low in Breast Cancer. Exploring the biology and updating best practices for testing and treatment. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash NRG 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. So welcome to this uh, symposium on a new view of the spectrum of HER2 expression and significance of HER2 low in breast cancer. I'm Stuart Schnitt from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, and we have a really excellent uh, symposium uh, for you this morning. Uh, the faculty, in addition to me, include uh, Paolo Tarantino, who is an advanced research fellow at the Breast Oncology Center at Dana-Farber and Harvard Medical School. Uh, probably or arguably the most published person on her too low on earth uh, as of this date. George Reese Filo is someone who needs no introduction to a pathology audience. He's chief of experimental pathology and director of the Experimental Pathology Fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Uh, and we honestly have been working together for several weeks to try to make a program for you that we think will be both informative and entertaining. So the goals of this presentation are to improve your knowledge of HER2-low breast cancer, including the clinical scenarios, terms and definitions, testing methods that we currently use, and testing methods that are on the horizon to better identify these tumors. So the way we've structured this program is that Dr. Tarantino will give us the foundational aspects and evolving understanding of HER2-low breast cancer from primarily the clinical perspective, I will then talk about current strategies for HER2 testing to identify HER2 low breast cancers, and Dr. Reese Filo will talk about future directions in HER2 testing to improve the detection of HER2 low breast cancers. And that will be followed by a panel discussion with interactive uh, Q&A and uh, reflections and conclusions. So I think we're ready to get started. So the first talk will be by Dr. Tarantino entitled The Foundational Aspects and Evolving Understanding of HER2-Low Breast Cancer. Thank you for the introduction, Stu. Thank you to everybody for being here at this early time of the day. I'm very happy to be here to discuss my favorite topic in oncology, which is HER2-Low, of course. I'm going to start from a few years ago with this talk, but in the 80s and 90s, when HER2 as, a, as an oncogene was characterized and it was shown that about 15 to 20% of breast tumors harbored amplification of the HER2 oncogene, which led to overexpression of the HER2 oncoprotein on the cell membrane. And these tumors, this 15 to 20% of the tumors, exhibited a very distinct uh, clinical and biologic characteristic and a worse prognosis compared to HER2 negative tumors. However, this prognostic value was reverted by the development of hint 2 agent. And in the beginning, this was trastuzumab, an, an ER2 blocking a monoclonal antibody. And the, the addition of trastuzumab to chemotherapy led to major advancement, both in the early and advanced disease settings. Nowadays, not only trastuzumab, but actually eight ER2 agents are approved by the FDA or EMA to treat HER2 positive breast cancer. And once again, this once was a very aggressive and poor prognostic entity, and nowadays it's probably the, the um, subtype of breast cancer that we're able to treat the best, even more than hormone receptor positive or two negative. And the uh, overall survival for her two positive is progressively rising in time, and in the last trials we've seen also with certain drugs that we can lead to more than five to six years of a survival in the metastatic setting, and we can cure up to 90% of the patients in the early setting, and and this thanks to all of these hinter 2 drugs. And so the traditional HER2 pie chart, as I said, 15 to 20% of tumors are HER2 positive, but the remaining part of the pie chart has been called HER2 negative for the past two decades or more, mostly because it was not um, a sub subtype of breast cancer we could treat with hinter 2 drugs. They didn't work, basically. Despite the fact that there actually is some HER2 detectable with immunohistochemistry, even in what we call HER2 negative breast cancer, thousands of HER2 receptors on these cells that once again we call HER2 negative. And so it was worth to ask, could this 
pa patients with these tumors that are HER2 negative, but with some HER2 detectable, with IHC derived benefit from HER2 blockade. And the, the largest trial to ask this question was the NSABP B47, um, a phase three adjuvant trial attempting to uh, to see the benefit of trastuzumab, adjuvant trastuzumab added to standard chemotherapy for patients with node positive or high risk node negative breast cancer that had what we call today HER2 low disease. So IHT1 plus or 2 plus fish negative. And the addition of trastuzumab to chemotherapy in this trial led to no benefit in invasive disease free survival or overall survival. There's actually two curves there, not only one. And, and so even when looking at the advanced setting, Pertuzumab tested in HER2 low or HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer led to an objective response rate of 2%, progression free survival 1.5 months. Basically, HER2 blockade in HER2 negative or HER2 low, HER2 non amplified breast cancer doesn't work, doesn't bring clinical benefits. However, in the last 20 years, we've worked hard at developing novel anti drugs, not only HER2 monoclonal antibodies, but also. Antibody drug conjugates, that is the class of drug we're going to discuss mostly today, but also by specific antibodies, vaccines. In general, we've expanded the arsenal and I guess her two to treat breast cancer. And the first antibody drug conjugate to be developed in breast oncology was TDM1, trastuzumab and tansing. And this was approved for treating metastatic breast cancer in 2013, but was tested also in a subset of her two negative tumors and was found to be not so effective, response rate of 4.8%, median PFS of 2.6 months. So in general, TDM1 is not the best agent for her to negative breast cancer for a variety of reasons. And these reasons were tackled by a novel generation of antibody drug conjugates. So the way antibody drug conjugates work is delivering chemotherapy towards cells expressing a certain antigen, in this case, HER2. However, novel conjugate compared to TDM1 have a higher amount of chemotherapy linked to each antibody, what we call drug to antibody ratio, that for trastuzumab drusium, for instance, is eight, whereas for TDM1 was about 3.5. And then you have a cleavable linker. TDM1 has a very strong linker, very stable linker that allows to deliver the chemotherapy that that remains into the cell. In this case, we have a cleavable linker that allows for the bystander effect and the payload can diffuse also to nearby cells, even if they don't express HER2. And finally, novel payloads. Most of the ADCs we've developed uh, have got microtubule inhibitors as payloads, but novel antibody drug conjugates are testing novel payloads, including topoisomerase 1 inhibitors. And trastuzumab of the deruxecan is the agent that exemplifies all of these features. It's got a topoisomerase inhibitor, DXD, with a high drug to antibody ratio of 8.8 .8 per, per 1, uh, a tumor selective cleavable linker, and evidence of bystander tumor effect. And here, once again, the mechanism of action, once the ADC is internalized into the cell, the, um, the compound is degraded, the payload can exert its effect in the tumor cells, but can also diffuse the nearby cells and exert the bystander effect. That it's something that is supposed to help in heterogeneous tumors. Tumors have heterogeneous expression of antigens. And the first time we saw the activity of TDXT in uh, HER2 negative or HER2 low breast cancer was in uh, the phase one trial, J101, where it was tested in a subset of 54 highly pretreated uh, metastatic breast cancer patients. And in this setting, usually highly pretreated HER2 low setting, we don't expect very high response rate, but in this case, we saw 37% response rate with similar activity in IHC 1 plus and 2 plus and a median PFS of 11 months, that was really remarkable back then. It was really, really, really remarkable. And also other agents confirmed that we can target HER2 expression with antibody drug conjugates, and in particular, trastuzumab, duocarmazine, and dicitamab vedoting to very different agents, but still able to achieve a response rate of 30 to 40% with a median PFS in this case between four and six months, just to confirm that this subset of patients is targetable. And so this led to change a little bit the pie chart of HER2 targetability. Not only the 15 to 20% of HER2 positive breast cancer were targetable, but actually an entire new subset of 50% of breast cancer that are called now HER2 low. Once again, I see one plus, two plus, non amplified that can be targeted with novel ADC. Uh, and it's half or even more than all metastatic breast cancers, but it's important to remember that the percentage really depends on the hormone receptor expression, because 
among hormone receptor positive tumors HER2 non amplified, about two thirds are HER2 low, whereas among triple negative tumors, about one third, 30 to 40 percent, are HER2 low. And when we look at this uh, in, in our subset at Dana Farber Cancer Institute, what we found was that actually there is a continuous association between the estrogen receptor and the um, expression of HER2 low expression. And so among triple negatives, you have 40 percent that are HER2 low, but going slightly up, you have 46% of the ER low that are HER2 low and gradually increases up to her ERI more than 95%, then 62% of the cases are HER2 low. So it's always important to remember that there is this strong association and so the, the higher the R expression, the higher the likelihood of having HER2 low expression. But once we looked and several groups looked at the genomic profile of HER2 low tumors compared to HER2 zero, that are the two subsets that compose the HER2 HER negative macro area, what we and others have found is that there's like minimal differences in genomic alterations between HER2 low and HER2 zero. It's not that there are different entities in terms of genomic alterations. And even in terms of prognosis, um, a wide variety of trials have been conducted to elucidate if her to low, exp low expressing tumors behave in a different way compared to her to zero. And once you correct for the very important confounder of hormone receptor expression, and so you divide hormone receptor positive from triple negative tumors, there apparently is no major prognostic significance for her to low expression. And this was recently nicely shown in a study from the National Cancer Database of more than 1 million patients. So a very remarkable study that divided triple negative from HER2 HR positive and looked at HER2 low versus um, HER2 low versus HER2 zero. Uh, and what they found is actually that the curves for overall survival are overlapping in each, in each setting, in each stage, stage one, two, three, four in both cases. And so really no major prognostic significance in this case. And so. HER2 low, is it a distinct entity? Well, it has no benefit with treatment with trastuzumab, pertuzumab, no distinct genomic profile, and no distinct prognosis. So, not clearly a distinct subtype of breast cancer compared to HER2 zero. And so, why bother defining this new entity of HER2 low breast cancer? Well, one main reason, and this reason is called Destiny Breast 04, there is the trial that prompted a standing ovation last year at ASCO at the plenary session, and this was a star phase three study that, uh, that tested um, trastuzumab derusic and versus chemotherapy of physician choice in a population of patients with metastatic breast cancer that was HER2 low, so IHT1+, 2+, non-amplified, that had been treated with one to two lines of chemotherapy and endocrine treatment, if applicable, and most of the patients in this trial had hormone receptor positive disease, but there was a subset of 10% that had triple negative disease, and the primary endpoint was progression-free survival in the overall, in the um, HR-positive population and in the overall population. And when you look at the, um, at the population enrolled, the median numbers of prior lines was one chemotherapy, the median numbers of prior endocrine treatment was two lines, um, the HER2 status was nicely divided, about 60% 1 plus, 40% 2 plus each negative. And once again, 90% of the population was hormone receptor positive in this trial, 10% was triple negative. And what you can see is that trastuzumab deruxic in this population that is, once again, HER2 low, does not have the amplification of HER2, well, still had an impressive activity and doubled progression-free survival compared to traditional chemotherapy. And from, four point, from uh, five, about five months to 10.1 months, both in the hormone receptor positive population and also when you add the, the triple negative population for another ratio of 0.5 that was statistically significant. And most importantly, also overall survival was statistically significantly improved with trastuzumab deruxican compared to um, chemotherapy of physician choice with uh, an improvement from 17.5 months to 23.9. We have a ratio of 0.64 that once again was statistically significant, both in hormone receptor positive and in the overall population. And then even when you look at the small subset of, of triple negative breast cancer patients, only 58 patients, but still there was a benefit in progression-free survival and overall survival. We have a ratio of 0.46. So a major advantage for all the population of HER2 low metastatic breast cancer patients 
And in terms of toxicities, in general, these were fairly similar to what we observed with chemotherapy, which just shows that ADCs are targeted chemotherapy. So they have a targeted mechanism of action, but they also harbor the toxicities of chemotherapy. And so you still have nausea, cytopenias, and important to remember also pulmonary toxicity can be seen with uh, trastuzumab deruxigan. This led very rapidly after the presentation at ASCO to the approval by the FDA in August 5th, 2022 of trastuzumab deruxigan for her to low breast cancer. More recently also in Europe in January 26, 2023, for patients with HER2 low, IHT1+, 2+, plus ish negative, metastatic breast cancer who have received a prior chemotherapy in a metastatic setting or developed disease recurrence during or within six months of completing adjuvant chemotherapy. And so now we are at a place where TDXD is approved for HER2 positive breast cancer, for HER2 low breast cancer, and so the only patients that don't have access to TDXD are those metastatic breast cancer patients that have a HER2 zero value, about 30% of the population. And so we might ask ourselves, is there any chance that actually TDXD could work even in a HER2 zero population? And it seems impossible because it's zero, but what we know actually, if, if we look with better assaying, we're gonna see in the next two presentations, is that zero is not zero. And we also saw it clinically because in a very smart French small phase two trial, the DAISY study, TDXD was tested in a subset of HER2 zero metastatic breast cancer patients and the response rate was 30%, which is higher than what we see normally with chemotherapy, with a um, PFS of about 4.2 months. But I believe we need to see more, and we might see soon more, because there is a second trial after DBO4, another phase 3 trial, the DBO6, Destiny Breast of 6, that is testing trastuzumab deruxigan versus physician choice of chemotherapy in a fairly similar population to DBO4, but with some slight but important differences. First of all, not only in HER2 low, but also in what we sometimes call ultra low. So those tumors with IHC zero score, where you can still detect some HER2 expression. So less than 10% of tumor cells showing faint expression, more than zero, less than one. We still don't have a clear name for this, but we can call it less, more than zero, less than one, or ultra low. And this category might expand the targetability of the pie chart further, and then this trial is restricted to almost at positive, there is no triple negative patients enrolled. It's a larger trial and it's for only for chemo naive patients. And so we've seen that we have recently expanded the pie chart of HER2 targetability from only those 15 to 20% of HER2 positive to a larger, a much larger fraction of patients with HER2 positive or HER2 low. In general, HER2 expressing by immunohistochemistry. However, if DBO6 is positive, we might see a further expansion, a further slice of this pie, the ultra low or more than zero, less than one, that might also become targetable with TDXD and potentially other ADCs. But what we will see in the next presentation is that actually there's novel methods that are being utilized to look for HER2 and which might potentially allow to unlock the full pie chart, the full spectrum of HER2. It's important always to remember that HER2 positive is a distinct subtype that behaves in a distinct way and can benefit of a wide variety of HER2 drugs, but still potentially any patients might be eligible if there is enough HER2 expression detectable with novel assays for potent ADCs. Thank you, Paolo. That was a terrific overview on how we got to where we are today in 2023. And what I'd like to now discuss are current strategies for HER2 testing to identify HER2 low breast cancer. And I thought I would start out with a brief historical perspective. So as you may remember, those of you who are old enough, back in the 1990s, there were several pivotal trials that led to the FDA approval of trastuzumab. And those were really two major trials. In patients with HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer, trastuzumab monotherapy was effective in patients who failed treatment with prior chemotherapy. And in the other trial, trastuzumab plus chemotherapy was more effective than chemotherapy alone as first-line treatment for these patients with HER2-positive metastatic breast cancer. So, that led to, on September 25th, 1998, the FDA approval of trastuzumab. And 
Trastuzumab has now been around for almost 25 years, and you may have lost sight of the fact that back in 1998, this was a really, really big deal because this was really, uh, as the New York Times said on September 26th, the day after the FDA approval, uh, that the FDA had approved the first genetically engineered drug for the treatment of advanced breast cancer. So this really was totally revolutionary at that time. At the same time, the FDA approved a companion diagnostic for testing for HER2 positive breast cancers, that is, her SEP test that was produced by the company called DACO at that time. But when you think about it, we had problems with HER2 immunohistochemical testing from day one. So the antibody used in her SEP test is not the same as the antibodies used in the immunohistochemical assay performed in the pivotal clinical trials. Her SEP test had never been evaluated in a clinical trial before its FDA approval. It showed only 79% concordance with the assay used in the clinical trials. And from the beginning, there were all sorts of concerns about methodology, sensitivity, and specificity. Furthermore, in the early days of HER2 testing, there was absolutely no standardization of pre-analytic factors like ischemia time and fixation details. There were enormous variations in testing protocols. Hercept test wasn't the only uh, HER2 immunohistochemical assay that was available. There were, over time, many, many other antibodies available with different protocols. But I remember in the early days of Hercept test, DACO had very stringent criteria as to how to perform the test. But when people didn't like the way it worked in their lab, they said, well, you know, we'll let this go a little longer in incubation or we'll jack up the temperature for the antigen retrieval. So even people who used Hercept test played with the assay uh, that deviated from the FDA-approved assay. And there were always variations in interpretation and reporting. Furthermore, as more and more people started getting tested for HER2 in the setting of randomized clinical trials, it became clear that there were problems with HER2 testing. For example, in the NSABP B31 randomized trials, it was found that 18% of community-based assays considered positive for HER2 overexpression could not be confirmed in central laboratory testing. And similarly, in the intergroup N9831 trial, a quarter of community-based assays considered positive for HER2 overexpression could not be confirmed in a central lab. So problems from the start. And this led ultimately to the understanding that we had serious concerns about HER2 testing in the early days, which really were related to lack of standardization of pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic factors. And the big problem in the early days was too many false positives. So let's jump ahead to 2007 when ASCOCAP published their first HER2 testing guidelines, which were aimed at addressing these problematic areas. And as you know, these guidelines were updated again in 2013 and most recently in 2018. And it's of interest that the emphasis of these various iterations of the ASCOCAP guidelines were different. So in the 2007 guideline, the primary focus was to reduce false positive results for the reasons that I just showed you. And the uh, percent uh, positive cells to score a tumor as 3 plus was raised from 10% as used in the clinical trials to greater than 30%. Well, Unfortunately, the pendulum swung the other way and we were winding up with too many false negatives. So ASCO cap brought back the 10% guideline in their 2013 update. And in the 2018 update, there was very little attention paid to HER2 IHC. Most of that update was focused on less common fish patterns using the dual probe assay. So this is the most recent algorithm for HER2 testing from ASCO CAP. This is the 2018 guideline uh, for IHC. And as you can see, cases that were scored as 1 plus defined as incomplete membrane staining that's faint or barely perceptible in greater than 10% of the tumor cells are called 1 plus. Tumors that have either absolutely no staining or membrane staining that's faint, barely perceptible, and in less than or equal to 10% of the tumor cells were called 0. 
but combined, these were called HER2 negative. And for many, many years, many pathology labs were simply reporting cases as 3 plus, 2 plus, or negative, and lumping together the zeros and 1 pluses as HER2 negative. So here are some examples that I hope many or all of you will agree with are representative of the categories defined by ASCO CAP, 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus. But for us as pathologists and for patients and medical oncologists, everything changed on June 5th, 2022, as Dr. Tarantino pointed out. And that was the date of publication of the Destiny 04 trial in the New England Journal of Medicine. And as Paolo showed you, there was in this trial, in association with trastuzumab deruxtecan, a reduction in risk of disease progression or death by about 50% and a reduction in risk of death by 36%. And again, as Dr. Tarantino pointed out, when this was presented at ASCO, the speaker received a five-minute standing ovation. So this was really revolutionary and practice changing. So a few points about the Destiny 04 trial. There was central HER2 testing of archived tumor or a recent biopsy. The HER2 assay that was used was Ventana HER2 assay using the 4B5 antibody. And again, in this trial, HER2 low was defined as IHC1 plus or IHC2 plus without gene amplification. Now, the publication of this paper, as I'm sure you remember, resulted in an immediate clinical need to reliably identify HER2 low breast cancers. And at our institution, we had always been scoring HER2 zero and specifying that it was either zero or one plus. But I know at many institutions, pathology reports just said HER2 zero parentheses, uh, uh, HER2 negative parentheses zero or one plus. So what are the problems with diagnosing HER2 low breast cancer? Well, when you think about it, the HER2 IHC assays were developed to detect HER2 positive breast cancers, that is those that are HER2 three plus, those that have high levels of HER2 overexpression. These assays have insufficient dynamic range to reliably distinguish between HER2 zero and HER2 one plus cases, and they were never meant to be used for this purpose. Furthermore, we know from a variety of studies that we as pathologists have very, very poor inter-observer reproducibility in distinguishing HER2 zero from HER2 one plus cases. And that was emphasized by this paper from David Rim's group published last year, in which 18 experienced pathologists looked at 170 cases with HER2 stains. And in this study, they found only 26% concordance between the diagnosis of HER2 zero and HER2 one plus cases. Now, admittedly, these pathologists who did this study weren't specifically told to focus on zero versus one plus. They were simply asked to score the cases as zero, one plus, two plus, or three plus. But one could argue that this, in fact, represents routine clinical practice. Other problems with diagnosing HER2 low breast cancers is that many labs don't use the Ventana platform and the 4B5 antibody used in the Destiny Breast 04 trial. I know we do not use that in our uh, pathology department. Furthermore, the sensitivity for identifying HER2 one plus cases has been shown to vary among different assays. For example, if you take the same tumor and stain it with Herceptest and 4B5, Herceptest is more likely to give you a one plus result than 4B5. And in this scenario where we're looking for very small amounts of uh, reaction product, pre-analytic factors are likely of very, very critical importance. That is ischemia time, fixation time, uh, antigen retrieval methods, et cetera. Furthermore, HER2 low breast cancers don't necessarily know they're HER2 at every stage of their uh, uh, evolution. And there is evolution of HER2 low expression over time. So then the question is, which specimen do you test? If you have a HER2 low, if you have HER2 zero in one specimen from a patient, do you go back and test other specimens to hunt around and look for a specimen that's HER2 one plus? And again, the bottom line is that for almost 24, uh, for about 24 years now, between September 1998, when uh, uh, trastuzumab and Herceptest were approved, to June of 2022, there was no need for us as pathologists to distinguish HER2-0 from 1-plus cases because they were both considered 
HER TO NEGATIVE. SO WHAT ARE WE REALLY BEING ASKED TO DO TODAY? WELL, WE'RE BEING ASKED TO IDENTIFY BREAST CANCER PATIENTS WITH HER TO LOW TUMORS WHO MAY BENEFIT FROM TRASTUZUMAB DURUXTACAN USING A TEST THAT WAS NEVER DEVELOPED TO IDENTIFY THOSE PATIENTS, THE RESULTS OF WHICH ARE SUBJECT TO CONSIDERABLE INTER-OBSERVER VARIABILITY. So we have to function, we have to practice, we have to identify these cases. So what are we supposed to do? Well, I think the best thing we can do now is look to organizations uh, for guidance in this area. And I can tell you that the three of us were involved in the European Society of Medical Oncology, or ESMO, expert consensus statement on the definition, diagnosis, and management of HER2 low breast cancer. And I will give you a preview of that. Dr. Tarantino is the first author on that uh, guideline. And ASCO-CAP will also be coming out with recommendations. So with regard to the ESMO expert consensus statement, this again is preliminary, this is not carved in stone, but this is pretty close to probably how it will be published. There were seven questions addressed that relate to pathologic diagnosis, including how we as pathologists should score HER2 low expression, how should we report HER2 low expression in pathology reports, then the question is, can all validated HER2 assays be used to interchangeably identify HER2 0, 1 plus, or 2 plus without fish amplification? How should we handle cases that are borderline between 0 and 1 plus? What additional education and training do we need to report HER2 low cases? What's the role of external QA programs in this setting? And what technologies may improve the quantitative detection of HER2 low expression? That last question will be addressed in the next talk by Dr. Reese Filo, but I'd like to focus on three of the questions that are probably the most relevant to us right now in our daily practice. So the first one is how should pathologists score HER2 low expression? And the current draft of the ESMO guideline says that we should score HER2 low expression using the ASCO-CAP 2018 algorithm, but with the recommendation of the simplification that was utilized in the Destiny Breast 04 trial, namely the use of faint rather than faint barely perceptible for the definition of zero and one plus. Now let's think about that for just <laughs> a minute. Because... I googled the definition of faint, and one of the definitions of faint, as you can see down in the red box, is barely perceptible. So I personally don't see how dropping barely perceptible from faint is going to change anything, but there were some pathologists in the ESMO panel that felt very strongly about this, and for some reason that's what they did in DB04. So, the second question I want to address is how should we as pathologists report HER2 low expression in pathology reports? And I know a lot of pathologists have been in a panic state about this. But the bottom line is that ESMO will likely recommend that we simply maintain a nomenclature consistent with the 2018 ASCO CAP algorithm and score HER2 IHC as 0, 1 plus, 2 plus, or 3 plus in our reports. Now, what does this do? This in turn allows the clinicians to determine whether or not the case can be considered eligible for trastuzumab deruxtecan. And the guideline will likely say that the use of the term HER2 low is not advocated in the pathology report, whereas its use is justified in clinical practice as an interpretation of the HER2 status of the tumor that we provide as pathologists. Now, the third question that I wanted to address is how should pathologists handle cases that are borderline between zero and one plus? Because I think this is a critical distinction today. And the bottom line is currently there's insufficient evidence to recommend how best to categorize these cases. And the recommendation from ESMO will be that they should probably be reviewed by at least one other pathologist and be categorized as best as possible as either zero or one plus using the current ASCO-CAP guidelines. 
Now, what about the ASCO cap recommendations? Again, this is under review, I've been told, by Antonio Wolf and Kim Allison, who are the movers and shakers of this. But rumor has it that ASCO cap will recommend that we continue to score HER2 IHC according to the ASCO cap criteria as either positive 3 plus, equivocal 2 plus, negative 1 plus, or negative 0. Furthermore, they're likely to recommend that we spend time examining these stains at high power of 40x when we're trying to distinguish between 0 and 1 plus, and as the ESMO guidelines suggest, have a low threshold for seeking another opinion for cases that are on the borderline between 0 and 1 plus, and they also will likely recommend using controls with a range of HER2 expression, not just strong HER2 3 plus types, but also HER2 uh, uh, tumors, that, uh, um, tumors that show low levels of expression, including 1 plus. And rumor has it that ASCO Cap will also recommend that we not use HER2 low terminology in our reports. So what's the rationale for not using HER2 low terminology in pathology reports? Well, I think many people think that HER2 low is a clinical interpretation of the immunohistochemical results, analogous to triple negative breast cancer. So we certainly report breast cancers as ER negative, PR negative, and HER2 negative based on our IHC assays, but we don't typically use triple negative in our pathology reports. Furthermore, only some cases considered HER2 low can be categorized as such by IHC alone, right? When we're looking at an immunostain, if it's 1 plus, we could say, well, this is in the HER2 low category. But if it's 2 plus, we don't know whether it's amplified or not. If it's not amplified, it's HER2 low. If it's amplified, it's HER2 positive. So this could result in inconsistency in reporting cases as HER2 low based on the immunohistochemical findings. Now, as you know, because you're all here, this is a very hot topic. So hot that 21% of all the breast abstracts at this meeting deal with HER2 low. So when you're walking through your posters, one in five is going to be on HER2 low. So as Paolo mentioned, the critical unanswered question is, will HER2 zero cases, that is ultra low and null, respond to antibody drug conjugates? If that is the case, then there will be no need to distinguish HER2 1 plus from HER2 0 cases, and assessing HER2 may become binary, where we break HER2 positive breast cancers into those that are overexpressed or amplified versus all others. In the meantime, are there better ways than current IHC methods to reliably identify HER2 low breast cancers? And this topic will be addressed by our next speaker, Dr. George Reese Filo from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Th thank you for that, Stu. Uh, you gave me a really poison chalice now <laughs> <laughs> uh, to discuss with you the future directions in HER2 testing to improve the detection of HER2 low breast cancers. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, and to have the opportunity of discussing this with you, because I think here the technological developments that are coming about will help us define this in a much better way. I'm not sure how clinically useful at this stage, but much better way. Anyhow, so in, in the, for the purpose of this talk, I'd like just to recap with you um, her to low breast cancer is where we stand now in March 2023, and then I'm going to give you new methods in three different flavors. Quantitative protein assays, artificial intelligence-derived methods, and transcriptomic methods, and then some conclusions and future directions. So I think now in 2023, where are we? We're doing, we have to do the HER2 low assessment as uh, Paolo and Stu have alluded to. We have to use the 1, two, uh, one plus, 2 plus, ASCO, uh, fish not amplified ASCO cap guidelines. The immunostochemical assay that has been developed was not <laughs> developed for this purpose, was developed for HER2 positive amplified as a And um, the inter-observer agreement as illustrated in, in Stu's talk is far from perfect. Furthermore, as we have already mentioned, with the DAISY trial uh, results showing an objective re uh, uh, response rate of 29.7% in patients that were HER2 zero by ASCO CAP guidelines plus the uh, results of uh, the breast destiny 6 trial that will be reported later this year, it's, everything's basically changing. 
And um, we need to be able to provide a much better quantification of HER2 levels in the tumors that are not HER2 positive using the ASCO cap guidelines, the 3 plus or 2 plus each amplified. So with that in mind, there are several novel methods that have been developed recently to ascertain the levels of HER2 expression in cancers. Uh, one that's very interesting and I find really appealing in the way it was developed is the HER2 quantitative continuous score. It was developed by the AstraZeneca team, basically using commercial samples to begin with. They used their central testing, uh, the immunostochemical results, and then trained a deep learning method based on pathologist annotations, so it's a supervised method uh, of analysis to quantify the expression levels of HER2 in the different subcellular compartments, including the cell membranes. Then they developed this assay and applied to the material of the J101 phase one trial with trastuzumab deruxtica. And what was really exciting is that when they looked, have a look at this, when they looked at the results of the HER2 negatives, the not HER2 positives by ASCO CAF guidelines, they looked at those results in terms of the distribution of HER2 quantitative values, okay? Uh, they observed that there was a spread, there was a great distribution of values there, and that they could split uh, this subset of uh, HER2 not positive into two groups, one that is low expressors and one that's high expressors using the HER2 quantitative score, and the ORR was very different between the two groups, suggesting here that the quantitation was really uh, uh, meaningful from the perspective of the reanalysis of this phase one trial material. Uh, this does not mean that this, uh, this test can be used to stratify in a predictive manner the, um, the, the patients with a HER2 not positive, let's put it this way. Uh, however, it does show that there is a spectrum of expression within the tumors that we classify as uh, not positive. Um, but I have to say that this was only quantifying immunostochemistry using assays that are already developed uh, in the context of uh, uh, using artificial intelligence methods. So just better quantification using machine learning methods. But with the development of multiplex immunofluorescence, I have to say that long gone are the days that where our dynamic range was only that offered by a DAB, and we, we had to do one marker per slide. As a matter of fact, now we can do up to 90-something uh, markers on a single slide using one of the commercially available platforms for multiplex immunophenotyping. So it's, it's, it comes as no surprise that many groups have now sought to use this type of combinatorial immunofluorescence uh, assays to try and quantify several different parameters in cancer, including the microenvironment, as illustrated here on this slide, uh, but also the expression of different uh, proteins or pathways within a given cancer cell, and perhaps just a better way for us to quantify with a much greater dynamic range the expression of HER2 within the cancer cells of a tumor. And I think the work done by David Rim's group is really exciting in that regard because they developed um, um, quantitative HER2 assessment based on a multiplex immunophenotyping using the system that they had developed back in 2002, the Aqua system, whereby you can provide a real quantification of the expression of a protein within a given uh, cell population and uh, with great precision. So the way they did it was to use this system, uh, benchmarked the expression of HER2 using uh, breast cancer cell lines for which the expression of HER2 was quantified by mass spec. So th there was a real uh, comparison, and a gold standard coming from the cell lines where they benchmarked the assay against, and then they used the, the characteristics of the aqua system whereby they could, they could assess the expression of HER2, 
they could put a mask to identify the cancer cells and then quantify it in absolute terms. And what they found was, again, really exciting and proving a very important point that goes back to the comments that were uh, mentioned during the previous talks. That, that is that even within HER2 negative breast cancers, there's a great degree of HER2 protein expression that we may not be seeing or quantifying adequately using the ASCO CAP guidelines. Have a look at this. These are the results of this uh, quantitative approach um, that uh, Dr. Rim's group developed. Here are breast cancers. Uh, each, each bar here is a breast cancer. Uh, color-coded according to the legend here using the ASCO CAP guidelines. And I hope you can appreciate here that there are examples of, let's say, uh, HER2 negative cancers that expressed pretty high levels, HER2 zeros by immunostochemistry that expressed pretty high levels of HER2 using the system. And they, because they had benchmarked this against MASPEC, they could define the limit of quantitation of the assay and the limit of linearity. So you would have a much more granular quantification of the HER2 levels within each one of the breast cancers. And this study showed two very important points. That, for instance, cases classified as HER2 1 plus, could, as cases A and B, could have really levels at the limit of quantification, but sometimes much higher. And they were still classified as 1 plus. And 2 plus could, again, the same story, go from very little to pretty high as well. So showing that these categories that we use for using immunostochemistry actually can comprise a really wide spectrum of expression levels if we quantify them more accurately. Importantly, these two assays highlight a very important point, that we can have um, low expression, absolute quantitation, on the basis of low levels of expression across all tumor cells, or we can have because a small number of cells within a tumor express high levels. And we have to remember that these assays then also provide information related to heterogeneity within the cancers. And I think that that can be really useful when we start thinking how we can start stratifying these patients in a better way. Paolo is looking at me and, and thinking, George, stop talking nonsense here. There's the bystander effect. But we do not know the extent of this bystander effect yet. Um, and the final approach here that was presented at, uh, uh, San Antonio, uh, at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium a few months ago was an, another point, uh, uh, approach developed by Patrick Coyne, whereby basically they um, extract tissue from the sections using laser capture microdissection and then use reverse phase protein arrays to quantify the expression levels of HER2 and this is a method that, if done with very stringent quality control, can, can be really quantitative as well. And they analyze 175 uh, HER2 white C0 breast cancers. Some are positive, some are negative. And what they found here that, again, is really important and consistent with the results of the DAISY study, consistent with everything that has been discussed before, that approximately 43% of uh, HER2 zero ER positive breast cancers express some levels of HER2, and that within the HER2 zeros ER negative cancers, around 30%, 29% express some levels of HER2. So I think that the bottom line here is the category that we call HER2 zero now comprises a, a subgroup a sizable sub, subgroup that does express HER2, and we're not calling it HER2 low or whatever terminology you want to call. Now, moving on to the artificial intelligence methods here, not, but not to quantify the expression on, on uh, let's say, process slides. Artificial intelligence methods apply to H&E slides to infer, let's say, the HER2 status on the base of H&E uh, stained uh, stain sections. And this has come to become possible because of the technological developments of the last 10 years with the development of slide scanners that produce images that are of sufficient quality and sufficiently quickly so that we can use them. 
uh, and now several places are accruing large cohorts of these um, slides. For instance, at Memorial, we have almost 8 million slides digitized, and with the development of computer processing power, storage, and the graphic processing units, and these large collections of slides, we now have the ability of deploying artificial intelligence approaches to answer many, many different questions uh, when it comes to breast cancer, including improving diagnostic accuracy and efficiency, cancer typing and grading, characterizing the immune microenvironment of tumors, quantifying immunohistochemical assays, as I've just shown you, identifying novel biological subtypes, or even come with predictive markers. But one aspect that I would like to highlight here is that we can even predict phenotypes or genotypes coming from just based on the HNE. And does this work? Yes, it does, because there are two proofs of principle published in Nature Cancer in 2020, one by one of my close friends and collaborators, Dr. Jakob Kata, the other one by the Sanger Institute, where basically they obtain data from TCJ, just uh, the images and the labels for mutations, for gene, for gene expression signatures, or for clinical parameters, and demonstrated that one could infer from the HNE the presence of, for instance, 53 mutations really accurately, uh, could identify some gene expression signatures like the basal-like signature uh, here with a pretty good area under the curve over 0.8. Uh, but I, I, I would ask you, most of us here would be able to tell one of our residents that a tumor is very likely to be a basal-like breast cancer on the basis of histology. So it's just showing that there is a phenotypic representation. And of course, the histologic and clinical subtypes. Uh, in particular, lobular carcinoma did not do too bad here. And again, because we know that there's a morphologic correlate, a histology here that can be picked up. So on that basis, so what we have sought to do in our group in partnership with uh, page.ai, and this is one of my conflicts of interest here, um, we try to leverage one aspect of HER2-negative breast, uh, breast cancers that was quite interesting um, for us to try and address the question of what breast cancers are really HER2 zero. They express no HER2. And we're very fortunate because a large proportion of our patients end up being profiled with the 21 gene score. And in, the, in those reports, we also have the quantitative assessment of HER2 mRNA. Okay, so on that basis, what we did was we retrie retrie uh, retrieved the results of the immunohistochemical assays. And as you can see here, Several cases were reported as 0, 1 plus or 1, 2, 2 plus, 2 plus. And so we did not curate these results at all and just plotted the HER2 mRNA expression levels according to the different immunohistochemical um, classifications of the tumors. And if we focus on the HER2 zero by immunohistochemistry, you'll see that it has a bimodal distribution when it comes to mRNA. There's a peak here around 7.4, 7.6. That's the limit of detection of HER2 mRNA using the assay. And then there's a second Gaussian distribution. So if we think about this curve here, okay, the, these cases here that are HER2 zero by amino chemists that express some HER2 mRNA, there are two possibilities. One, that the cancer cells do express HER2 mRNA. The other is just entrapment of normal breast tissue, because that would give us a positive result. So we did not use those results at all. We focused on these tumors here, the ones that are HER2 zero by immunohistochemistry and had no HER2 mRNA expression. And then we trained a system whereby we got the histologic whole slide images, we split them into tiles, then um, put these tiles through a multiple instance learning system uh, that was developed by uh, Dr. Thomas Fuchs, where we uh, trained in over 40,000 slides, where we can stratify breast cancers into uh, invasive breast cancer, in situ, pre-malignant, and then we use only the areas of invasive carcinoma. And then we extract this data, the vectors, uh, and put it through a forward aggregator neural network, whereby we had a training, tuning, and validation sets, 631. 
and asked, can you classify, can you identify for us the HER2 zero, by, uh, completely zero, the immunohistochemistry zero, mRNA zero, okay? And these are the results. So here it was our first attempt presented last year at ASMO, where basically we obtained an area under the curve of uh, approximately 0.91, which is good, not perfect, but good. The sensitivity is still not perfect. It requires further refinement, but it's a very interesting way uh, to look at the histology, and the histology itself is providing sufficient elements to us for us to be able to find those cancers that are HER2-0-0. Zero, zero. And I find this really exciting because it does come to show that perhaps there is some different biology or different phenotypic traits. And then we looked at the same algorithm in terms of the classification of HER2-0 alone in a separate validation series. HER2-0, HER2 low or her to amplify the her to positive ones. And an interesting observation here is that the performance for the her to amplified was not as good as we anticipated. And why? If we look at a subset of her to zeros and her to positives, they are grade three breast cancer. There's a subset that overlaps and the algorithm finds it hard to differentiate those uh, that very extreme, the her to zeros that are three, uh, let's say, grade three rather aggressive breast cancers and a subset of the HER2 amplified that are grade three as well. So further refinement is required, but it does come to show that just by uh, looking at h &E, we can get to this point. And to finalize this talk, just a few words about novel methods for HER2 low assessment on the base of transcriptomic methods. And as we discussed, the HER2 lows now the study to date are on the basis of HER2 1 plus or HER2 2 plus ish negative. And when we look at these cases, the vast majority of them are ER positive, not exclusively, of course, but ER positive. But work from Alex Pratt's group demonstrated that within uh, HER2 low breast cancers, when we do pump 50, the vast majority of these tumors are classified as luminal A or luminal B. A small subset, 9 to 15 percent, are classified as basal-like. And then uh, only a teeny tiny minority are classified as HER2 enriched, uh, this, the subgroup from PAM50 that is representative of HER2. Despite the fact that very few are classified as HER2 enriched, it does, uh, uh, this type of analysis does come to show that the levels of HER2 mRNA are higher in HER2 low as compared to HER2 zero breast cancers. But there's a huge overlap, as you can see, between HER2 zero and HER2 low uh, in terms of the HER2 mRNA expression. And this speaks to the, the fact that what we have already discussed, the distinction between zero and one plus is not great from a biological standpoint. Um, we have also come to understand two important points that transcriptomic profiling methods now are highlighting the heterogeneity in terms of the biology of virtual low breast cancers. Um, there are f at least four subsets of HER2 low breast cancers on the basis of the work from Caterina Marchio, uh, where they performed transcriptomic and genomic analysis and found these groups, the lymphocyte activated that have abundant lymphocytes, the unique HER2 gain that are the cases that are HER2 2 plus fish equivocal, and they seem to have a different transcriptomic profile. Then the tumor stroma remodeling, where there's a lot of stroma, and of course these are enriched for lobular carcinomas, and the actionable PIK3CA mutations. This classification is not ready for prime time, but it does illustrate a very important point, that HER2 low breast cancer from a transcriptomic and genomic perspective, they are not unique. They are not a single entity. They are, are much more likely um, an operational term that we use clinically now. And um, the other point that I would like to highlight here is the development of HER2DX, a 27-gene assay developed by Alex Pratt's group based on four, four um, sets of um, genes, immune infiltration, luminal differentiation, tumor proliferation, and HER2 um, uh, amplicon expression. This has been used primarily for HER2-positive breast cancers, both in terms of prognostication but also prediction, and now is beginning to be tested in the context of the so-called HER2 low breast cancers. So it's interesting that 
perhaps this could provide ancillary information as well in the future. So in conclusion, I hope I have demonstrated to you that novel methods have the potential of improving the quantitation in a way that we, we are not doing now, just by doing immunostochemistry, reduce what we call false negatives here, and define subgroups of HER2 low breast cancers. But I would contend that the essential studies to get to the point that Paolo brought us to here with this prescient cancer discovery perspective is that we'll be classifying tumors as HER2 positive and all of the others that are not HER2 positive will have to provide some form of HER2 assessment so that we can prioritize which treatments will be given the patients afterwards because there will be many antibody drug conjugates and other therapeutic agents. And I think on that basis, if we identify through these new methods predictive markers of therapeutic response, then we'll be in a position of making really informed decisions. Until then, I think that's the best we can do, and most of this, these assays that I discussed today are part of only our translational research spectrum. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks. We, we've gotten a lot of questions uh, from the audience and from people online. Some of them uh, were submitted before the session and have already been answered, so we'll focus on some others. So there are a couple of clinical questions that I think are most appropriate for Paolo. And one was, um, have we had a discussion with our oncologists at Multidisciplinary Tumor Board? And how many patients are treated with TDXD based on our institution's IHC score? And how much faith do you as clinicians put in our score? Well, first of all, I'll start saying that I think DBO4 had one interesting, um, let's say, impact in the fact that it put together clinicians and pathologists to discuss about this so often and so hardly. And so it really was helpful to understand each other, the, the issues and potential solution on its side. I would say that we trust current staining, current results, because of course in the past, the distinction between zero and one plus was non-existent. Clinically, they were the same. And many reports that we have say zero slash one plus, just because once again, there was no difference in the past. They were both negative. And so now looking back at a sample from 2016, 2017, 2018, it's hard to really rely on that. Although I have to say that in DBO4, the way patients were enrolled in the trial that kind of brought her too low to the practice, even old samples, even HER2 scores on old samples predicted the activity of TDXD over chemotherapy. And I think for us clinicians, this is an important point because these results presented by Alish Pratt at San Antonio showed that either if you look at HER2 low expression on a recent biopsy performed just before starting the treatment or on an archival biopsy or even on the primary tumor resected years and years ago, still TDXD was superior to chemotherapy. And so this kind of comforts us that we can rely even on old samples, but still there is the likelihood that if you pick an old zero sample, that might turn into her too low with current uh, knowledge that we have. So from a practical point of view, let's say a patient has a lumpectomy and radiation therapy five years ago, develops metastatic disease that was biopsied, two years later, got chemotherapy, uh, and now develops a new metastasis. Where do you test for HER2 low and what do you believe? So if it was called zero back at the time of the lumpectomy, do you test the most recent metastasis? What do you want to see from us? We want to see HER2 low, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's the thing. Like Now we have a very potent um, treatment that we can use for our HER2 low patients. We know about all the issues that we have between 0 and 1 plus. And so we really don't want to deny a treatment that can be beneficial, that has an overall survival advantage for our patients based on an, a borderline score, let's say. And then we've seen that there is heterogeneity in time. And you can have a patient that was HER2 low on the primary tumor, and then on the last metastatic biopsy is HER2 zero. And we don't really know if this patient's benefits, although the, um, this retrospective analysis from DBO4 seemed to suggest that even just the primary tumor is enough, HER2 low expression on the primary tumor is enough to have activity from TDXD that is better than chemo. So in general, I feel that us clinicians are being very pragmatic, and we just look at HER2 low on any sample in the history of disease, and if there is no HER2 low of any samples, and if it's safe, perform a new biopsy and look for that HER2 law that can give access to a very potent drug. OK. 
Okay. Well, you know, one of, the, one of the struggles we have, as I mentioned, and as you well know, is distinguishing between the zeros and one plus, or the ultra lows and the nulls. Um, and, you know, again, at the ESMO consensus guideline, there was really no recommendation on how best to deal with those cases. So as a clinician, do you prefer if we're on the borderline that we push it to one plus or that we push it to zero? I, I know the guidelines specifically say what we should do, but from a practical point of view, when we have a case where we're sitting there struggling and two people look at it and we're not sure if it's zero or one plus, what do we do? I feel that DAISY really helped in this sense, because if I thought that zero means zero response rate, well, then I want to be extremely careful at avoiding using TDX linear to zero. But since we have seen that zero still can mean 30% response rate, meaningful PFS, still we see that there is HER2 expression even in HER2 zero, so actually I really feel like if you're generous with that report and put one plus instead of zero, I'm very happy. Well, you know, that, that's really comforting because certainly in many, with uh, many pathologists with whom I've had this, this discussion around the world and oncologists in other countries, uh, a lot of people say that zeros have become vanishingly rare in their clinical practice. Uh, and and Stu, uh, I, I, I keep joking with, with our colleagues that in the last six months, the whole biology of breast cancer has changed because the, the rates of HER2 zero went from a given number to less than half <laughs> over yeah. the original number in six months. So, yeah. But I, I agree with Paulo that we need a certain dose of pragmatism here. And we need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, breast destiny or sex, uh, when the results come out, we perhaps have to go back to the discussion that we are having here and rethink everything again. Because if, if, it, if the trial is positive, it means that what we call zero now is, is just, a, you know, it's not sufficiently accurate for us not to give the treatment for, for those patients. So a lot will change in the next 12 months, and we need to be cognizant of that. This is a transition period. It is, it is causing trouble for us as a community to assess it properly, but it will change again very soon. So another question that came up is the idea about quantitation by image analysis. And given the uncertainty and the fact that we really have to distinguish between 9% and 11%, should we be doing this routinely by image analysis rather than eyeballing? At, at this stage, to the, the, let's say the guidelines are not enforcing any, any of that. As I said, this is for translational research endeavors, and we'll be learning more and more as we have the material from the trials. The ability of deploying these technologies will be in, at a much stronger position in, in uh, let's say, uh, several months' time. Uh, it's important, however, that we are aware of all of these technologies because they may be required in the future, for, in particular because of the availability of additional agents in the patient journey, in the metastatic cancer patient journey, that will be overlapping in terms of indications. So we'll come to it, there will be a point where we'll have to prioritize which therapy we give in which order. And in that regard, I think those assays will prove very useful. Okay. So, Paolo, one, one question came up about uh, DBO6 and what assays be being used in DBO6 to determine HER2 status. To my knowledge, it's the same assay used in DBO4. It's the Ventana 4B5 assay. And, and so it's, it's likely if, if the results are positive, that might be the assay. There is a proof for that. But, but once again, there is many other methods that are being utilized to, to assess for HER2. And one thing I wanted to add is that um, we, we do want to uh, pathologists to be generous on HER2 in the metastatic setting, in the current use of TDXD, but there are studies ongoing in the early stage setting. There is a curative setting. We know that TDXD is a drug that has potentially fatal pulmonary toxicity among its toxicity. So probably as the development of this drug uh, advances, we might need also to think at each setting in a different way. And so in a metastatic setting, a pretreated setting where we don't really have major other available treatments, we want something to be generous, we want to have a low threshold to utilize it. In the early stage setting, probably we really will need to be careful about the way we assess HER2 because we only want to use TDXD and to risk the toxicities of TDXD if we know that it can be beneficial.
Okay. So there are a number of questions about heterogeneity. For example, how do we define it? How do we deal with it? George, do you want to address yeah. that? Yeah, it's interesting that a large proportion of these so-called HER2 low breast cancers, we, we can see the expression or low levels of expression of HER2 in a large population of cells within the tumor. There, but there is some variability, but you can detect. So in terms of saying it's present or not, uh, in, the, in the large proportion of tumors, we see some expression. But now that we're using really quantitative methods, we start finding tumors where there are only pockets of cells that express some HER2. In old studies, when we're thinking about HER2 amplified, uh, let's go back in time, back in 2015, okay, with several studies, some done by Anne Vincent Solomon and our group, where we looked at HER2 amplification, and then we microdissect these components and looked at them. The number of cases that had clonal heterogeneity amplified, not amplified, was not high, was limited. Now, in the HER2 low, that proportion is likely to be much higher with low, or low to zero and varying. And those cases, having that information in the translational studies going forward, for us to understand what are the response rates in the ones that have zero and one, or zero and some HER2 expression, versus the ones that have very little but across the tumor, will be essential and we'll have to learn. And in that regard, the algorithms that are being developed now are really useful. So, you know, one, one question came up about using uh, uh, these antibody drug conjugates in earlier stage breast cancer. And we know from history that the way drug use has typically evolved is it starts in the metastatic setting and then moves back toward the um, primary setting. So how do you see this evolving in terms of the use of TDXD and other ADCs um, for earlier stage breast cancer? So yeah, this is very important because we already have one ADC that has shown to improve outcome in the early setting. T TDM1, trastuzumab enhancing in the Catherine trial, has shown that among those tumors that are resistant to trastuzumab and chemotherapy, we can improve outcomes utilizing escalating to TDM1 in the um, adjuvant setting. And there is a phase three trial ongoing that might report, not too late, the Destiny Breast 05 that looks at trastuzumab deruxican versus TDM1 in these trastuzumab refractory tumors. So in the adjuvant setting for tumors that have been pretreated in the neoadjuvant setting. And I think this is a very appealing setting because you've already treated these patients, this tumor, with standard of care chemotherapy, trastuzumab, pertuzumab. And if that's not enough, you escalate to probably the most powerful anterior to agent that we have for at the moment, there is trastuzumab deruxican. And you might be able to improve outcomes there. There is also a neoadjuvant study ongoing, that is Destiny Breast 11, looking at trastuzumab deruxican versus multi-agent multi -agent chemotherapy and trastuzumab and pertuzumab. And there I feel that it's a bit more risky because there you're treating tumors and patients without any selection based on prior treatment. And so that is where, even if the trial is positive, I would really like to understand those tumors, if they're bad tumors or if they're average tumors or good tumors, and if we, can, if we need the most active treatment or if we could just treat these tumors with a little bit less. So there's a whole work ongoing in that setting, but I feel that in the future we'll be able to tailor treatments better, and in this, something that might be helpful is the HER2DX test, or in general, something that looks at, in a multifactorial way at the HER2 expression, at the immune landscape of these tumors, and the proliferative aspects of the tumor, and so can really tell us if this is a tumor that we expect to recur or not, but definitely work in progress in that I, setting. I had a, just a question for Paolo here. So... Uh, what do you think will be the role of predictive assays in this, in particular in the adjuvant or early stage setting? I think it's going to be huge because when you have only one treatment, you don't really need to adapt much. But when you have three, four, five, six available effective treatments, you really want to understand if you can give just, for instance, THP is a regimen that is emerging. There is a trial enrolling across the US, the Compasser, HER2 PCR, looking at giving patients with stage 2 to 3 HER2 positive breast cancer 
only one chemotherapy, paclitaxel, trastuzumab, pertuzumab, that is very well tolerated. And then if they achieve PAT-CR, just continuing with their two blockade. And this is very appealing. However, I would be scared to treat with just one chemotherapy a patient that has a tumor for which I perform one of these tests and it says, this is very aggressive. This is extremely higher to refractory her to her two blockade, extremely highly proliferative rate, it's, gone, it's got a high likelihood of recur. In that case, I might want to escalate. And we are not yet there. Right now, the best we have is treating this tumor in the new adjuvant setting and see what happens at surgery. But I think we need to get there in order to adapt treatment and to spare toxicities, but still cure as many patients as we can. Thanks. So th there was, a, I think, a very practical question about which immunohistochemical assay we should use. Should we use her test first, look at the results, and then use the Ventana antibody, use Ventana up front? Well, the problem, at least for us, is that we can't be starting new um, uh, methods of testing in our lab where we don't have the platform. For example, we do not have a Ventana immunostainer in our lab, and I don't think there will ever be a plan to get a Ventana immunostainer to do one assay on one subset of malignancy. So I think we're all kind of stuck with doing what we have in our lab and trying to do the best we can, knowing full well that there may be differences with different antibodies and different platforms. Any other comments about that? I would agree, Stu, at this stage, given the state of flux we are, uh, I think we need to be pragmatic. Yeah, and the other thing is, you know, I know that there are some labs that have kind of tried to retitrate their antibody to see if they could pick up more one pluses than zeros, but that comes at a price because you wind up potentially getting more false positives. So I think, you know, for the time being, I think we just need to sit tight with the assays that we're using. If the assays have been validated, if you're in a QA program, if you're in the CAP, program and your assay is working well, I think you need to just do that and do the best you can with it rather than go out and buy a new machine uh, or uh, start retitrating your primary antibody. And the guidelines too are not recommending anyone to go back and unlock their assays and go back to the drawing board. Right. What we are, uh, we are providing and uh, in the, these different guidelines is a set of um, best practices using the current assays that we have available. Absolutely. Of course, validated and subjected to quality control programs regularly. That's essential. I cannot uh, stop emphasizing this point. We need to be doing the best we can with the methods that we have. So one question that came up is, would you recommend retesting uh, a HER2 negative? If you have a HER2 zero on a core biopsy and the patient undergoes excision, with upfront surgery rather than neoadjuvant chemotherapy, should the HER2 be retested on the excision? And that could even be expanded to, well, how many blocks of the excision <laughs> should be tested on? Should, be, should it be tested on every block? I mean, how hard, I guess the bottom line is, how hard should we be hunting to identify HER2 low breast cancers in cases that are initially called HER2 zero? So I'll first give a yes, no answer. And <laughs> my answer is yes, because we do see some cases that are HER2 negative on the core biopsies and then turn out to be actually even HER2 positive. And so you can really improve outcomes in those cases. How many blocks should we look at? Let's see what George thinks. <laughs> <laughs> what I would contend is that, again, we are not making any changes in the guidelines. Uh, we are not prescribing... Uh, testing every single block. We're not asking for these fundamental changes. But uh, in part, in, in, if we test more, we'll just experience this phenomenon that we're seeing that the number of cases that we classified as HER2-0 is going to go, be going down and down and down. Of course, it's more testing, more possibility of a borderline result using an assay that was not developed to detect that particular window of expression, of course we'll get more. But I, I'm pretty confident that these questions will not be as relevant in a year's time. So we know that uh, some breast cancers that are clinically HER2 negative have HER2 mutations when you sequence them. So do we know anything about HER2 mutations in tumors that are HER2 low? 
I believe there is no major association between the two variables. One, one thing that we learned actually from the lung cancer setting is that her two mutations, can, tumors with her two mutations can respond to ADCs, to TDXD very well, even without IHC expression of her two. And we don't know if that's related to the heterogeneity or to what, but in general, her two mutant tumors are kind of a distinct entity. In, in breast oncology, we learned that we can treat those with TK eyes like neratinib, but it's still something that we are learning about, and I feel that it's a bit distinct from her too low expression, and there was a lot of go work at MSK about this. I don't know if George has some yeah, additional thoughts. Uh, it's interesting, Paul, if you look at the transcriptomic profiling of those her, her two mutated with the, the, either the extracellular domain or the tyrosine kinase domain, we, of course, we detect some expression of HER2 mRNA. So they are not, by mRNA profiling, they are not HER2 zeros. And uh, of course, it's expected. It's a gene that's uh, express, uh, mutated and it has an activity because it's expressed. Otherwise, it would have no biological impact. Um, now, how this translates in, in breast specifically with the, the current scoring system, we are doing this analysis actually at present. So one question, one of my favorite questions is, why test? Um, but I, I, <laughs> my guess is, I don't know if that person asked that question and left the room all fed up, but if you're still here, I, I do think that, of course, it's important to test for a variety of reasons. We need to identify three plus or amplified cases. And certainly, you know, as hopefully we've demonstrated that it's important, at least at the present time, to distinguish one plus from zero cases. That is the, the null end of the zero cases. Now, whether or not that will still be important over time, and again, as we all said, whether we go back to kind of a dichotomous or binary uh, way of looking at HER2 in terms of amplified and or overexpressed versus everyone else, that remains to be seen. What's your crystal ball telling you about uh, the zeros. And, and also, could you, do you know why um, the HER2 nulls or total negative ones were excluded from DB06? So first of all, I would like to, to comment to uh, actually thank those that back then in 2017, 18, thought of expanding the use, the testing of these ADCs, not only to HER2 positive, which were the ones actually thought to benefit from it, but also to HER2 low, because I think that was a bold move to test an interior 2 ADC in a HER2 negative, non-amplified subset uh, of tumors. A and that led to where we are today, that we have a drug that improves overall survival. And I really believe that back then, that was already bold enough, probably. And so treating also IHC zero, of course, could have been included in the trial, but back then zero was supposed to be zero, was supposed to be very negative, was supposed not to respond. I think it's, it was reasonable somehow to treat HER2 low expressors and then gradually expand. The thing is that, of course, based on that decision, now we are in this a uh, temporary evolving moment in her to assessment and her to and treatment of patients and we need to adapt to this change but i think it it was bold enough back then and it was very bold for the days investigators to have a cohort of patients with her to zero breast cancer in their trial there is a phase a small phase 2 trial it's not a large phase 3 trial but it's very interesting showing 30% response rate in ic0 and I saw a very interesting question asking, why is there activity of TDX thinner to zero? And I think the answer is not only one. There's more than one answer to this question. One part of the answer is that ADCs, antibody drug conjugates, are chemotherapy somehow. And, and when you inject this uh, monoclonal antibodies with attached chemotherapy, some of that chemotherapy will detach. In certain cases with unstable ADCs, it will be detach, detaching a lot. And so you do have some traditional chemotherapy effect that, that goes everywhere, just kills any cells regardless of any expression. And so, for instance, with the TROP2 ADC, Sacituzumab govitecan at San Antonio, we saw that there was activity regardless of TROP2 expression, and part of that is probably because that is directed chemotherapy, but is also free chemotherapy having effect. And then another part of the answer is the bystander effect, of course, because once the ADC binds to the cell, there is internalization, release of the chemotherapy to surrounding cells, and you really need just a tiny bit of her to, to have activity. So we are learning about that, but I really think these ADCs are very complicated and we'll need some time to figure out well how they work. 
There's a third point here, Paulo, because there's a subset of these HER2 negative or HER2 low breast cancers where there's a substantial entrapment of normal breast tissue. And remember, normal breast tissue does express HER2. So one could be witnessing this HER2 bystander effect, not on the basis of the expression in the cancer cells, but even in the entrapped normal cells. So there are so many mechanisms, so many reasons for these tumors to potentially respond. Uh, of course, what we, it behooves us now is to do the translational studies that are required for us to address all these questions in a, in a state of flux. And we have to remember this. We should not be too harsh on ourselves. We should accept that more will be disclosed to us almost every week now going forward. Well, we have about 30 seconds left, I think. So I'd like to thank uh, our speakers for fantastic presentations. I'd like to thank the live attendees for your interest and questions, and those of you online for your interest and questions beforehand and during. And I'd like to thank, again, Peerview for uh, setting this up. I think this was a very, very important session for us as pathologists today. And again, thank AstraZeneca and Daiichi for uh, funding this session. So thank you all very much. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash NRG 860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from AstraZeneca and Daiichi Sankyo Incorporated.